So thank you, Alexander. Uh, back again for more size. Um, I enjoyed your presentation a lot, Mark. It's uh, quite a lot of uh, synergies between what we're both uh, going to talk about. I'm going to be going at this at a pace. So um, we have an office, uh, a rather modest office of uh, about 12 to 15 people, and we needed a way to uh, analyse thermal bridges. Everybody knows about air tightness, everybody knows about insulation levels, but to actually calculate your own thermal bridges is, you know, it's, it's often quite a leap uh, for most offices and for, for most professionals. And um, we were struggling. We didn't want to be dependent on other consultants to be able to calculate thermal bridges. We want to be able to calculate them ourselves so that uh, we come up with a detail, we sketch it out by hand, first of all, and then we wanted to be able to analyse that detail and find out what the psi value was. We also wanted to use a software that's, more, that's free um, because um, everybody's on a budget nowadays, especially in the private sector, perhaps in the public sector too. So we basically have developed a tool uh, which you can use to calculate your own uh, thermal bridges, and I want to give you a bit of an insight into how that works. Um, as I said, Mark has shown some very nice graphics um, similar to what we're looking at about here. And really we're talking about um, problems like balcony extensions, uh, the, the, the floor to, to uh, wall junctions and around window trims as, as has been discussed. The thing about thermal bridges is it's not just about heat flow. I'm coming back again to the concept of comfort. And you might notice that uh, nice looking lady there in the advertisement for that over-engineered, overpriced um, thermal balcony separator. You'll notice she, wasn't, she was practically half naked and she was sitting right against the sort of potentially cold spot there in the construction. So then, could I go back? I don't, Mark maybe might put it up again early, uh, later on. So, you know, if you have a very bad thermal bridge in your building and you walk up against that uh, on a, of an evening, you're, you'll feel the chill in your, in your feet. Um, so it's not only about uh, energy loss, it's about uh, comfort. It's also about condensation. So if the temperature goes too low, you're going to get condensation, and then you're going to get mold, and then you're going to, it's going to impact on your health. So thermal bridges is not just a sort of number crunching exercise. It's actually important uh, to our well-being. So we can have condensation, structural damage, mold and fungus growth, all sorts of health problems, and last but not least, extra health flow. And if you think about the, the, the passive house concept, we've built this building now. It's very airtight. It's super insulated. It's got amazing windows, okay? So there's very, very little uh, areas left for that heat to flow out through. So, I mean, and it's going, heat is going to follow the path of least resistance. So thermal bridges are especially a bad thing in a passive house building compared to a normal building because it's the only uh, route out uh, for the heat. So we have to be especially uh, conscious of designing thermal bridge-free details when we're talking about passive house. Again, this might seem uh, a bit sort of childish to show a sketch like this, but we really want to make sure that we consider every detail, every junction, and everywhere you, your, your pen changes direction, uh, you've, you've got a potential uh, thermal bridge issue. In passive house land, we, we have a definition um, of what thermal bridge free is. And uh, again, Mark, I'd like to thank you for your presentation there. You're very good on the numbers. And um, what's regarded as thermal bridge free is 0 0.006 BTUs per hour foot Fahrenheit. And again, we're not talking foot squared here. We're talking about linear feet. Okay? So, th so we need to get our details down to this number if we want them to be regarded as thermal bridge free. Um, Joe, so, Joe showed some details uh, yesterday. I'm not sure if one particular one caught my mind where we had a floor slab and you had a wall. I don't know if you remember that or not. And there was no thermal break at that point. And uh, I, 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 I should have raised it with Joe at the, ti at the time just to, for, for the purpose of discussion. But if we have an internal uh, leaf of masonry here, CMU concrete, and we have a concrete floor, slab here and then we have some structure going down to a basement or down into the floor, we have a potential massive thermal bridge here. And again, if we design that uh, to be highly airtight, to be highly insulated, that's the only point of escape for heat. So you're going to have, a, a, if you like, a concentrated heat flow at that point. Um, 
We can use uh, aerated concrete. We can use foam glass. I'll show you some photographs at the end of the presentation. There are solutions for that. And basically, the, the thicker the element that you use here and uh, the better its conductivity, you can see the psi value is improving all the time. So really what we want to do is we want to use um, at, at typical places like that where we have uh, problems, we want to try and use a thermal break, uh, which is also obviously structural bearing, and I'll, I'll show you some examples of that when we finished. So Passive House Institute say thermal bridge free is 0 0.006, but how the heck do you know that? I mean, you can't know that by just looking at a detail on pen and paper. You have to calculate it. And lots of people here in the room, who here in the room has experimented with therm? So not so many people, okay. Now the thing about therm is, therm will actually bring you a part of the way to calculating a thermal bridge. It gives you lovely graphics and you feel great looking at these different sort of rainbow-like images, right? But it actually won't give you the psi value. So we recognized this in our own office and we said, right, well, we're gonna to have to come up with a calculator here because we don't want to be um, hiring consultants every time we want to calculate a, a detail. Again, Mark had gone through, about this, gone through very, very uh, uh, succinctly about this, very eloquently, so I don't need to repeat it very much, but we're used to calculating U values, um, and th there's pretty homogeneous heat flow in that situation, but when we get to the junction, there's a different effect going on here, and we have a two-dimensional heat flow. So, as Mark mentioned, the, the, what a psi value is, what a thermal bridge value is, it's the difference between this uh, two-dimensional heat flow or, or a three-dimensional heat flow, and the one-dimensional heat flow. So um, in term, we can calculate uh, what a U factor is, um, like a two-dimensional heat flow. We all know how to calculate a one-dimensional heat flow, uh, in other words, a U value, or at least we should know how to do that. And the psi value here, we have the psi value symbol again, is simply the difference between them. So it's the difference between two-dimensional heat flow and a one-dimensional heat flow. Therm is a software developed by the Lawrence Berkeley Lab down in California, San Francisco. Um, it's freely available. It's pretty easy to use um, once you get the hang of it. Uh, there are certain little things that you need to know, and I'm going to give you an insight into that now. Um, one of the things you need to do, know, of course, is you need to select a property. So uh, when you first bring a drawing or a sketch or a construction detail into this freeware, this therm, you have to select the material. So is it concrete, is it wood, is it steel, is it alumi aluminium? And so you, you have to develop a, a library or, or select uh, your material from a library. The other thing you have to do is you have to specify the boundary conditions. So heat flow, the, 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 the flow of heat uh, takes place um, quite differently through a wall as opposed to a roof, as opposed to a floor. So, and a, a basement, uh, an unconditioned basement floor is different than a, a conditioned basement floor and so forth. So there are various um, boundary conditions that we need to know and uh, the, the software tool that we've developed uh, basically highlights what those, are, what those boundary conditions are. So you select your material and then you say, right, this is outside land, this is inside land, uh, this, is, this has a certain surface film resistance and the other, sur the other uh, surface film resistances, so you specify all that up, and then uh, Term will then give you a U factor, okay? So most of you who have used Term have probably got to that point, and that's a good achievement in itself, um, so well done for that. And Term will also then give you very nice graphic output, um, it'll give you these nice uh, vector diagrams and flow diagrams, and that makes you feel great, and it, it, it looks very interesting, and we know the red on the left, for example, is nice and warm, and the blue on the right uh, is cold, but in actual fact, uh, that, that, that graphic output is actually of no use to you when, you're, when you need to model the energy, okay? So we needed uh, to develop a bolt-on tool for that, and that's what we call our Psi XLS. Um, one of the guys in the office went a bit um, freehand there with, the, with, with his graphic, but that's basically a sort of a modern-day interpretation of that Greek letter, Psi. One of the first things we have in this Psi calculator is a library of different junction types, and pretty much every junction type that you'll be dealing with is included there. And you're not expected to sort of read or understand the numbers there, but if you're dealing with a, a window junction, you sort of go to that detail and pick your boundary conditions. If you're dealing with a foundation detail, you go to that one there. If you're dealing with a, a, a roof to a wall situation, you go to there. 
So it's very, very easy, and it's like, a, it's like going to McDonald's and sort of picking a meal for yourself, whatever you feel like having on the day. Um, you then import the numbers that you've calculated in Therm. Okay, so Therm will give you these numbers, and we've set up an Excel file that you basically plug the numbers into this, and at the bottom there, it'll give you your psi value. This is very bad construction detail. You'll know that from Mark's presentation, 0.403 BTUs. Per foot, uh, per foot Fahrenheit. So, um, again, the process, you've got a construction detail like this. Um, this is a uh, very poor detail because we have no thermal break here, so there's going to be a lot of heat flow out to that junction. Um, you have to assign the boundary condition, so it's 68 degrees inside in our house, as we know. Or our building, we, we use a, a temperature of 14 degrees outside to simulate the exterior temperature. <coughs> And this is all, this may look very complex, but you just go to the McDonald's library and you pick the construction detail that suits uh, what you're trying to analyze. You have to do an ordinary U-value calculation, which most of you could do with, by pen and paper, I guess, but there's also a tool in there to help you calculate that. And um, you take your U-factor, so which is your two-dimensional heat flow, you calculate that in, in uh, that comes from term, and then finally um, you import these numbers ag again into this uh, psi XLS tool, and it gives you uh, your psi value here. Your U value, your U factor, and finally the psi value. Uh, we've run training courses uh, on this for architects. It's a two-day training event. Uh, Greg, you put up your hand there, Greg, one of our past uh, students there. So if you're interested to see how this actually works in practice, Greg might be. Greg's not a plant, by the way. He came down of his own accord from New York. But if you're curious to see how this works in practice, uh, it might be interesting uh, to talk to Greg about that. Where does this all go in then? Again, Mark, a very similar formula to what Mark had up on the, up on the board. How do we use this psi value? So now we finally have a number. We've designed a junction. Uh, we've found out the psi value, but what's the impact of that? Well, um, we have a, this is a formula for, for heat loss, transmission heat loss, and we multiply the psi value by the length, and we have a temperature factor, whether it's ambient or not, and we multiply it by the climate data. So in a very cold climate, uh, a thermal bridge is going to have a massive impact, and in a very mild climate, the thermal bridge is going to have a, a lesser impact. So again, we're talking about the length of a junction, and you can see here, let's say in the corner of this building here, we're not talking about area anymore. We're used to talking about area when we talk about U value or R value, but now we're talking about the linear length. So if we have a psi value, for example, of 0.034, and there's 50 foot of that uh, detail, let's say from the ground uh, up to the roof, and if it's ambient, this temperature factor is always one, and let's say this is our climate, uh, this is our uh, heating degree hours. This will actually tell us how much heat will flow out through that junction per year. If you find that very boring, uh, that's a pity because we need to understand uh, how heat flows and how energy flows, and the concepts are, are very simple uh, to, to get your head around. And obviously, if, if this number is zero here, then the end number, the, in other words, the heat loss number, is zero too. But if this detail is a very bad detail, like the first one I showed you, then this number is high, and therefore the overall heat loss is high. It's as simple as that. Um, I asked Alexander, would it be possible to have a look at some typical uh, Army Corps of Engineer construction details? And Alexander was very kindly sent me just a kind of a scattering of some of them, and um, I did a, we did a quick analysis uh, before I came out. Um, here we have a steel frame construction with a a concrete floor, and you can see already, or you can guess, I think, or anticipate, um, that this is not really an optimized detail. And we can see here the psi value of that is around 0.392. So again, if you think about uh, the, the, the thousands of linear feet, and you think about that formula, so we have the psi value multiplied by the length in feet, multiplied by the heating degree hours, you know, it's not long before these things add up to, to really, really, really high numbers. And think about the lady sitting there, sort of in her, in her underwear, uh, on a cold night, she's going to get uh, very uh, cool cheeks uh, sitting there. So she... There's a, an alternative way of doing this. 
And it's very funny, ladies and gentlemen, because this detail has come up now about three or four times in the last 24 hours. Um, and really what we're talking about is we're talking about putting the insulation on the exterior of this uh, steel frame construction. Then you can run your concrete floor in, no problem at all. And now you can see by these parallel colours, um, which term will give you, we're actually thermal bridge free. So we've gone from a big multiplier to a zero. No more impact. It's gone. It's forgotten about. You can absolutely forget it. And you now have a nice uh, service core here through which you can pull your cables, your pipes, your conduits and ducts and all sorts of things. So there's very simple solutions to this. And the software is free in order for you to analyze these details now. This was another detail that was shown a lot yesterday. And um, to be honest, we shouldn't really be building buildings like this anymore. You can see here, uh, you can anticipate now from Mark's presentation and my own, that there's um, a, a thermal bridge effect there, which would be very severe in a cold climate. Um, again, a very high number, 0.334. Think of that as your multiplier. And you may even get compensation at that point. You certainly won't be sitting down there having a glass of wine at the weekend because it's going to be absolutely freezing. Um, what we need to do is we need to put in um, insulation underneath that floor slab and we need to put in an isolator piece here and I'll show you an example of what that could be in a moment. It could be aerated concrete, it could be foam glass depending upon the height of the structure and, and the load bearing and then again guys we're gone back to zero. Okay, So this multiplier effect is almost nothing now and we've designed it out. And I mean, I think what Mark has done in having this library of details, that's an extremely important uh, step. We need, you shouldn't have to analyze these details again and again and again. Let's say you're designing it and you're designing it and you're designing it. There should be a library of details where we can dip into and pull out and say, hey, this is a good detail. This is where I should be doing it. Um, this is a, a certification event. We, uh, my office certified this building here as a certified passive house building and we're presenting the plaque here to the architect and um, two and a quarter miles of potential thermal bridges in this building. It's not a big building. You guys are div uh, involved in buildings much, much bigger than this. Can you imagine there's actually 12,000 linear feet? Just think of the formula that I showed you earlier on. There's 12,000 linear feet of potential thermal bridges in this project. Normal poor detailing uh, for this project would result in about uh, one third of the total transmission losses, a third of the transmission losses, whereas if you use uh, thermal bridge details, you could eliminate that uh, down to half of that or even, even down to zero uh, if you have very good details. So these things add up. You know, you're designing a building, you're responsible for that, you're going to drive by it perhaps every day or you're going to work in it, that building is going to be there for 50 years. And think about the psi value and the linear heat loss and the comfort and that lady sitting there at the weekend having a glass of wine. So what can we use uh, to cut out a lot of these thermal bridges? Uh, these are products, again, which are available on the market. Um, the company at the back there is in, importing some of these products now, I believe, 475. Um, this is foam glass. It's got a very good marketing slogan. Uh, the marketing slogan is, insulate, it's insulation that thinks it's a brick. <laughs> and it's load-bearing. It can carry up to about three stories of, of concrete. Uh, anything more than that, you have to use something quite different. It's very, very lightweight. Um, and it, it, it can help you uh, achieve a very, very good detail. Um, again, Mark uh, showed a, a very nice example of this shock isocorp. So we can have balconies. We shouldn't, you know, we should still have good aesthetics, good amenity, uh, good uh, outdoor space in our apartments. That shouldn't be the problem. You know, uh, we put people on the moon, we can surely detail uh, a good isolator piece for uh, a balcony. So this is what it looks like in reality. Um, on, the, on the foreground here, on the inside, on the lower side of this line is our building, our house, where we want to sit down in our underwear. And on the outside here then is a balcony, which we want the same flow, we want it nice and level. So we use this isocorb uh, product here. There are steel bars then going uh, crisscross here, connecting this structure to that structure. And then you pour your concrete, this is from a just slightly different angle now, but you can see here then you have your cantilevered balcony, no problem, same level. And it's not thermal bridge free, it's not this 0 0.006 number, but it's a very, very good number. Okay? So we just need to be clever and design good details, come up with new products. And the more products we come up with, by the way, the more employment we create, the more generation, you know, so 
sustainability is not just about the environment, we want a sustainable economy as well. And there's opportunities here for people to invent new products and to generate green collar employment. Um, another uh, example here, this is a rather radical uh, job. Some of you might find this rather amusing, but this was a listed building in Germany. Uh, there was some problems underneath, so they had to underpin the structure of it. But um, before sort of finishing this off, they, they slipped in this, um, this uh, foam glass here. You can, I don't know if you can see that very faint black line along here. So basically, they were able to isolate uh, the, the masonry construction here, brick construction, from the new uh, basement wall. And again, it would be very easy to miss that detail. And what a pity, because that will never be done again. You know, and it, you, can, you can insert that in there for almost nothing, and you've got comfort, no mold, no condensation, and much reduced heat loss. I'd love to say this was a friend of mine, but <laughs> you recognize who that is, of course. And we need to do things differently. We need to think about how we build buildings differently. We can't use the same old uh, yada yada approach to construction. If we want to uh, leave a good legacy of buildings in the future, we have to try and do things a little bit differently. So thermal bridges have very profound effects, not just for heat flow, but for comfort and for health and for mold. Large projects have miles of junctions, literally miles of junctions. Remember the, the Empire State Building, 25 miles, and that's only the windows. It's very easy to get it right and there's lots of new products available. And I got finished without the sheriff coming over to me <laughs> shooting. So I'm finished. Thank you.